spoken language. I haven't thought about flying for a long time. I have a dream that at that moment when I was alone above the clouds for a long time. I have dreamed waking up in a room surrounded in blue and green grass for more years than I could dream of memory. I have walked back into the past or scratched on the doors of my origins, where it all came from, since the hand of that cape for the last time. Return to Kent Town 10th year anniversary edition is a revised version of Ambien's first poetry book. The book can be purchased from Amazon and it contains numerous additional materials. Spoken later. You wake up one morning after not reading a book since your school days and you decide to be a writer. With no good or bad writing to compare against your own, you just know how to write and anyone who tells you otherwise is wrong. Hell, maybe they're jealous of your natural ability to craft a masterpiece. After all, most people need to learn through a combination of books, courses, critical feedback and workshops. Not you though. It's not their fault. They don't realise your natural talent, but they soon will. How to Write Wrong is the new book by Amanda Steele. The book, which is an interactive story, gives the reader multiple options throughout its story. The book can be purchased from Amazon. Spoken Thank you today for tuning in to Spoken Label. Spoken Label was originally set up at the beginning of 2016 and as of recording has over 200 sessions in our archive. Although the podcast can be heard on Anchor, iTunes, Apple, Spotify, YouTube and literally 10 or 11 other networks, the full archive can be found at Spoken Label, all one word, spoken label dot bandcamp dot com. On the bandcamp, it is set as pay what you want, so you are entitled if you wish, you can download it or stream it for nothing. But if you have thrown me a couple of pennies my way, it is always eternally grateful to help me maintain the operating costs and future running costs of the podcast. Enjoy. Spoken Label. Hi guys, Andy N, Spoken Label, back in the house, and this is a treat today. My first live and person podcast for Spoken Label for nearly six months. Mm-hmm. And to show you how unusual it is today, we've gone back to school. <laughs> We're up to, who's with me today? Amanda, but I'm yeah. not really here. <laughs> Amanda's <laughs> just here. Imagine, isn't it? She's just a willing, <laughs> willing audience today. Now, we've gone back to school today because we've got um, a dear friend of mine, I've we're just working out. We've got. I've known this gentleman for nearly ten years now, actually. Yeah. And I'll let him introduce himself in a minute. But he's he's a teacher by trade, and I'm um, actually sat in one of his classrooms. So. So make sure you behave yourself, or there'll be a detention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is brilliant. I've not sat in a class like a classroom like this for probably fifteen years now. I did one, one more than that actually. Over twenty hours as a student back in the late nineties. So, I've not had such well-behaved people in the room before. It's usually a group of 16 <laughs> and 17 year olds throwing things at each other, so it's a, <laughs> it's a privilege to invite you in. <laughs> oh, heck. Now, then I was wondering, Amanda's trying to throw a can of like coke at me here. So. <laughs> I'm keeping an eye on her, yeah. <laughs> You've got to watch these, what, these, these, these Bradford lasses, the troublemakers. Now, but seriously, I've got Tony Kinsella with me today, and he's the third one of the Bard Company troupe. I first interviewed Gordon Zola, the member there, and that Alan, or Gordon, holds the record for Spoken Label, because... There's about a 90 minute session of his online. I can well believe it, yeah. <laughs> and that was good, answer, to Tony. That was great fun that day, then. He kept coming up with projects, and I've known Alan a long time, yeah. like you. I, he was kept coming up with projects I'd never heard of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then um, I chatted to Jeff fairly recently, Jeff Rama. And Je- Je- Jeff, I mean, Jeff, Jeff knows, Jeff, not Jeff, like for keeping it brief <laughs> to the point. Oh, did he keep it clean? Not in the slightest, right? <laughs> but then we're over to Tony today, over sat in one of his classrooms. So Tony, obviously, first of all, tell people who you are, and it's up to you whether you want to tell them what, you, what you're teaching, what you're doing your teaching or uh, not. The, the teaching's the boring bit. I teach, I teach, I've taught every aspect of English in 32 years of teaching, from hmm. people who could barely hold a pen up to A-level, so uh, at that's the moment... Me. That's me. Yeah, and, and, he's, and he's holding his pen perfectly well at the moment. <laughs> but uh, primarily at the moment, uh, I'm a GCSE English teacher because... Hundreds and hundreds of kids are leaving Salford schools without a pass grade. And the wonderful David Cameron a few years ago decided that they had no choice but to be doing English and maths. On t- I'm being slightly sarcastic there because uh, as a teacher, it's keeping me in work. And I do support the idea that uh, you know, kids, kids should be leaving college with a good English and maths qualification alongside whatever curriculum they're doing. So that's the boring bit. But uh, yeah, since 1999, I've been doing um, stand-up comedy. 
and um, either short projects or longer ones. So they've incorporated some poetry ever since '99, but I've been performing poetry on it in its own right. Not necessarily comics, some serious and political stuff, some funny stuff, uh, probably for about 15 years. So uh, I've been treading the boards for quite a while, it's fair to say. Yeah, but you say, do you say, do you often mind me walking down to your classroom before you've been writing the stuff since you're much before that, weren't you? Really? Yeah, so, I, was, I was writing stuff and sort of, you know, hiding it uh, in my own uh, little diaries and, and notebooks and stuff without ever really showing it to anybody. Um, it was, uh, yeah. I think I've probably been teaching for a few years before I had the confidence. Teaching is a very good grounding for both um, performance, poetry, and stand up because there's so many transferable skills. You're, you're standing in front of a group of people, you're trying to engage them and to a certain extent keep them entertained. You're dealing with hecklers, you're, you're trying to uh, keep people's attention on you and uh, you know being well prepared and getting your timings right. So I think I had to do about five or six years teaching before I really had the confidence to stand up in front of people in, in a different context. Do, do any of your students know you actually do, do this? Um, yeah, they usually get wind of it. There was a story um, a few years ago when I was teaching um, a GCSE English class and the son of a very famous comedian in Manchester called Smug Roberts uh, was at the college. Oh, yeah. But he wasn't actually in my English class. He'd already passed English. And uh, he was doing a film course uh, at another campus. And he had to do some sort of film. So he filmed his dad performing at the Three Minute Theatre in Manchester. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was comparing that night. So he was showing mostly about his dad. But there was a little two-minute clip of me uh, doing a bit of warm-up. And, and then all the, other, all the kids who do do English in, in, uh, in his class were saying, why have you been filming our English teacher? <laughs> What's our English teacher doing up on the stage telling jokes? So once once it was out, it was out. And, you know, quite often the teachers will just mention, "Oh, your English teacher." Oh, I can't stand my English teacher. Oh, he's a very clever bloke. He does comedy. So then they'll come into my class and say, "Is it true you do comedy?" So, so it's very difficult to keep it under wraps. Obviously, I teach 16, 17 year olds. So because most of my performances in in the pub circuit, when we're not locked down and stuck inside, uh, then there wouldn't be much opportunity for them to go and watch. In the past, I have been. I've taught adult classes and. They've got wind of it, and sometimes they've turned up uh, to watch me and support me. So, oh, right, yeah. no, yeah. I wasn't sure how it react sometimes. You know, if I like, because my case, like, you know, I'm a civil servant, and yeah, I just operate under a slight alias to do, just abbreviated my name for years ago. Yeah, and I've had it was always at the time designed to try and keep it separate, like your cases, but it worlds have come like collide, don't they, all the time? Yeah. So, yeah, I suppose you've got to be careful with social media, you know, if, if, if they saw my name online and turned up. <laughs> not, not that there's anything I would not want to. I do swear quite a bit sometimes <laughs> when I'm doing stand up, so that might come back and haunt me at some point, but uh, I don't think it'd cost me my job. I think I've got every right to do what I want in my non curriculum time. So. Yeah, <laughs> in my case, I just keep the politics out of it. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but if I'm going to do a, do a tax, I do it personally, or, yeah. do, it, or no, I do I do it for mask of history, history <laughs> lessons, <laughs> and that way I can get away with stuff then. So, but yeah, obviously, back to you anyway. Um, you said before, obviously, you started the stand up in the late 90s. Yeah. What drew you to it then originally? Again, there's a, there's a story connected with teaching, fully enough. There was um, a very eccentric character called Alan Wilde who was in my A level class. I had an A level class that was two evenings a week, A level English language. And there was coursework in those days. And for the coursework, the students had to do any piece of writing and they could choose exactly what they wanted to do. They could do a short story, we'd do song lyrics, poetry. And they would then have to write a commentary explaining where their ideas came from. And this lad Alan came to me at the end of a lesson and says, could I do my stand-up comedy script? Because uh, I'm a stand-up comedian. So my first thought was, absolutely, that's an absolutely brilliant thing to do for A-level coursework because, you know, the amount of wordplay and so on involved in comedy. But I didn't know that there was that circuit, that kind of open mic circuit. I'd seen Jasper Carrot at the Apollo. I knew, I'd seen somebody at the dance house. So I, and I knew there was that whole Bernard Manning circuit, which is not my cup of tea. Uh, the kind of working men's clubs. Oh, yeah, that was a strange. Well, I've been to watch that a few times. That's yeah, that was a strange show. But I had no idea that any Joe Blogs could get up on stage and stand behind a microphone. And so uh, I said to Alan, um, "I write comedy. I couldn't perform it myself. But if you have a chat with me, he was learning to drive. So I did some comedy about driving lessons. And he went on tour with Johnny Vegas all around the country when Johnny Vegas was a uh, an up and coming act." And he kept on messaging me saying, thank you so much for that material. It's going down really well supporting Johnny Vega. But he didn't play Manchester. They were all over the country. Oh. And when he came back to Manchester, he was doing an open mic spot, which is now called the Comedy Balloon. But at the time, it was called the worst comedy night in Manchester. <laughs> and I said, I'll come and watch you tonight. Well, it was a Wednesday night. I'll come and watch you and you can do some of my jokes. But Alan being Alan, if somebody heckled him in the first few seconds, he would completely abandon his material and just improvise. So I got along to hear my jokes and see whether they got a laugh and he didn't do any of them. <laughs> So I said to him at the end, I was a bit uh, annoyed there, Alan, because, you know, come along especially, and he says, oh, well, why don't you come and do your own jokes next week? And my first thought was, God, never in a million years, like I couldn't stand up on stage. And I was driving home that night, and I was thinking about, there'd been about nine or ten acts on. As I say, it was called the worst comedy night in Salford, so 
And I got thinking, if I'd been on that night and I'd just learned, you know, 10 minutes of jokes, little bits of paper with the jokes on, would I have been the best one? No, there was about two or three very good ones. Would I have been the worst one? Absolutely not, because there was about half a dozen. It absolutely died on the backside. And I thought, I could do better than that. So the following week, I learned 10 minutes of jokes, went up on stage, got enough laughs to, to give me the buzz, and then, you know, never looked back. <laughs> that was way back in 99. I've been oh. performing stand-up for 21 years ever since. Wow. So obviously, that po- your poetry came afterwards, didn't it? So. Well, the very first night I did, I remember, I don't know where it is now, but I remember doing a poem called Testosterone Man, and it was about so, it was a time of man at CNA and stuff like that. It was basically a Mickey take of, you know, laddish men sort of thing. And I had it written down. So that was one of the things I thought, if I could do five or six minutes of jokes and then read a poem, then I'll be able to relax a little bit at the end because I won't have to remember anything. I'll have the poem in front of me. So since day one, really, I was kind of incorporating a certain amount of poetry. I never thought of a few kind of comic poems. And sometimes sometimes it works really well because on a typical comedy blue mm-hmm. open mic night, you'd have 11 or 12, usually males, usually all white males, all doing jokes about relationships and stuff. So if I could shove a couple of poems in, it was something a little bit different. Yeah, but sometimes yeah. the audience would appreciate the fact that they've seen something of it. And yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you found action, this, but yeah. poets almost always get a round of applause just because you can put words together that rhyme or, or whatever. So it was a good way of guaranteeing that oh. you got some sort of positive response. No, no, completely. Oh, brilliant. Okay, um, obviously, um, I know you, obviously, no. Since obviously we first met, we wrote for about 2011-ish. We're trying to figure out exactly when it was, but yeah, yeah that sounds about right, well, yeah. No, this is where my dates are at diabolical. <laughs> uh, your first collection came out before you joined Bard Company, didn't That's it? Right, was yeah, wasn't before. Before. Yeah, yeah. It was a while before, wasn't it? Yeah, so, 2013 and Bard Company started, I think, I think 2015, was, but I might be wrong. I think it was but 15, yeah, I think it was 15, because... Right, uh, the band I was with Jeff had means and means and finished right, at yeah, about the same yeah. point. We've got mutual it, mutual band member, haven't we? Yeah, we yeah. crossed it crossed <laughs> over that point. Yeah. yeah, that's why it makes sense. Tell us about your first collection then. So right, so um, I mean, I've always, I've only self published, um, and you know, just tried to sell them to friends and given a few as, as presents to family and so on. I've got a very good friend who's on the comedy circuit, who performs as Rod Shepherd, but he's actually called Jeff Downs, and he actually works for um, Manchester Council, but he does all the techie stuff all the kind of filming and printing and all that type of stuff. So he very kindly um, did the editing, sorted out the cover uh, feature and um, uh, made sure that I got, I, I kind of paid about a quid a copy to print them to a reasonably good quality. So because that opportunity was there and it wasn't going to cost me a fortune, I was going to at least break even, uh, I decided to, you know, I had poems on the um, inboxes in, on laptops and I had lots of stuff on scribble bits of paper, but nothing to kind of keep them together for posterity. So it was yeah. more that than anything else, really. To, well, tell uh, us about the title of it, first of all, because it's a great title. And you're, yeah, you're a great man with titles. I've got to think about very long titles for some reason, yeah. So um, the first book is called If You Tolerate This, Your Brain Cells Will Be Next. And what do you mean one every title? Which like is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> man I, man I, is nodding head and look, waving a can in the air. I always mix it up. Is it the Manic Street Preachers? I've, I've nicked it off a bat. It's the Manic Street Yeah, I always yeah. mix yeah. those yeah. 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 I'm not going to sing it. Yeah, but I just heard the title of that song and then it just dawned on me that that, you know, just kind of uh, boulderising that title would be quite a nice one, yeah. Was it the material in that collection? Was it all quite a con- concentrated time in written, or was it all various um, points? No, I'd say, you know, I've, I've had a couple of volumes out now, and they've both, both basically been the kind of legacy of stuff that I've been writing for quite a while, so um, I don't think there was anything from 99, so that would have been really uh, going some, but uh, there was probably stuff that I'd written over the past three or four years that ended up congregating into the book. I'd started to um, do more poetry and perform more poetry. And the other thing is, having a book looks a lot more professional on stage <laughs> than having lots of little bits of paper. Oh, yeah. I'm not one of these people who can memorise. I've got about three or four that I could just about get away with at the drop of the hat without without having to um, rehearse no, them. They're not like our mutual friend Gordon Zoe. No, I don't know how he does it. He's much older than me, and he can remember absolutely reams and reams of stuff. Sorry, a little bit older than me. Sorry, Alan. Yeah, sorry, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just say you're, you're about the same age for a couple of years. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I see, yeah. And I say, I thought, because it's some. Um, I lo- no, you love what your material is, and you can elaborate your style, I know you about your style on this one. Because um, you're often, after you do your know, full length shows, which we can talk about in a minute, but I most mem- always memorise you more for your bullet point poems. Yeah. Your tiny little ones. Where does. Where did you get the idea of that? Because I've seen you do that a number of occasions, and they got on there. I think sent electric each time. I think if I've had one moment of genius in my entire life, this was probably it, because there's loads of real dad jokes, you know, jokes that everybody's heard before. And I kind of found a way of taking the joke and turning it into a poem. So <clears> you almost win a kind of double whammy, because if the joke is funny enough, it's probably going to get a laugh anyway as a joke. And if you've then actually managed to make it rhyme, and it's amazing how many times you can make a joke rhyme, and then suddenly you've got... Um, 
nice, nice word you've used for it, a little bullet point poem, a little uh, it's like know, it's, hook line poem. Yeah, it's almost like something to take the teacher in you, basically. You can put it up on like a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> yeah. That's I'll give why. you one example, which is one of my favourites. Uh, actually, there's two on this page. Again, exactly what you're Reading talking about. Reading man, man Well, these are two very short ones, but they're, they're in the kind of vein that you're talking about. The base, these are basically one-liner jokes that I've somehow managed to change into a poem. So the first one's called A Catholic Upbringing. Telling your schoolboy impure thoughts is really humiliating. We called it confession and penance, but Father Murphy called it speed dating. <laughs> <laughs> and the second one is uh, A Dodgy First Date in a Posh Restaurant, another long title. Title's wrong with the, the poem. <laughs> the menu is a little bit tricky. Cordon Bleu for the Nouveau Riche. I told her I wanted a quickie, but the correct pronunciation was quiche. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, there's an old dad joke. Yeah, yeah. I had the right mistake at uh, the date with my girlfriend last night. I asked her if she wanted a quickie, but it turned out the pronunciation was quiche. So it's a joke. Yeah. But because niche and quiche rhyme, and because uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a French restaurant, you can somehow manage to, and as I say, you, you get a double winner because... Uh, People like a short, pithy poem, and there's also a good joke lurking in yeah, there. So. It's, 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 it's good. It's, that's what I love your style with them because they, 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 they cross over into both genres brilliantly. Yeah. And I've seen you do full length sets on both of them before now. Yeah, and quite comedy crowds that, and yeah. comedy yeah. sets. Yeah. And it goes down like a storm each time because they're just I, so I just funny. love what liners I mean, my favourite comedians are people like, uh, I'm sure people know Milton Jones and yeah. Gary Delaney, Stuart Francis, a brilliant American one called um, Dimitri Martin, an older one called Stephen Wright. <laughs> Uh, Emo Phillips, they're the comedians that I really love because uh, Gary, Le- Gary Delaney's last um, tour was called Comedy Purist and he was making the same point that pure comedy is joke, joke, joke. Yeah. I love storytelling comedy and my yeah. people like Billy Connolly can go on with half an idea and keep people entertained for two hours. I can't do that. <laughs> That's not necessarily the sort of stuff I gravitate towards. I really like wordplay. Maybe it's part of being an English teacher and a poet, uh, but I really like wordplay and I like it when the jokes are contained within the, the double meaning of words. Yeah, now you've done a couple of full length shows, haven't you, over the past couple of years? About seven or eight now, over, I've seen over a few years, yeah. yeah. Four of them, I seem to recall. Yeah. I've had mostly at Gulliver's now. Okay, tell us about what made you want to start to full length shows. Yeah, uh, back to the link with teaching again, because um, I've been teaching for 32 years now, so that, that tells me that it was seven years ago. I hit 25 years of teaching, and I've done loads <laughs> of uh, guest spots. I've, I've done a little <laughs> bit at the comedy store, not on the big nights, but there's a Sunday night thing called New Material. Uh, that I can sometimes get on, you know, two or three times a year. So I've done the comedy store, and a lot of people might know the buzz and um, excess malarkey and stuff like that. I'd only ever really done 15, 20 minute slots. Um, and when I hit 25 years of teaching, I just got to thinking, I've never attempted to write a full length show. And I should write one about 25 years of teaching. And when I first started, all teachers have to learn all about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm sure some of your listeners have probably come across it. I don't know why. I was told all about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I've been teaching for 25 years and I've never used it. So I thought, I will use it now. I'll have it as the backbone of a comedy show. So I did a show about Maslow. And I did some research into who Abraham Maslow was. I did lots of jokes. I had the um, hierarchy of needs up on stage with me. And I also collaborated with them. Uh, I always tend to collaborate with musicians. So at that time, it was a friend of mine called Dave Lockley who did some music. He did um, I Don't Like Mondays and Don't Stand So Close to Me, which are... Uh, a song based in the classroom. So that, that was the idea, and it just kind of broke up. So once I've done that one, I've kind of set myself an objective. I thought, I really enjoyed doing that. Um, I'm going to write one hour of comedy every year and try and make it better and better and better, and, you know, sort of challenge myself. So I did one, I did a couple on um, Scandinavian concepts of happiness. That's how rock and roll my shows are. <laughs> one on Danish Hygge and one on Swedish Lagom. And then I've done, um, show, I did one when, when Brexit happened in 2016. I knew lots of city breaks in Europe. So I did a show that was, for about oh. the first 20 minutes, was my views on Brexit. But then it was my five favourite European cities. And I, I remember that one. You saw yeah, that one in Gulliver's, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah um, and then uh, I've done one based on bands. I did one on um, Shangri-Las, the American band. Um, I did, and I've done one on the undertones. Uh, so, yeah, so a whole range of things, really. But I oh, was St. Pauli Football Club. I'm a big fan of a, a left-wing German football club in Hamburg called St. Pauli. I've done a show about them. And it's been great because I love the writing process. People say to me, like the Undertone show, it took me six or seven months to write it, a few more weeks to rehearse it. I, uh, I worked with a, a singer called Steve O'Donoghue and got him involved in it. And then eventually I did it a couple of times locally. And then I actually took it over to Derry Theatre and did it with a couple of the Undertones in the audience. I really, people, I've seen the pictures of that yeah, one. Yeah. Think, yeah, which is on YouTube. But uh, people say to me, you spent all that time writing it. You only did it two or three times. And then you moved on to your next project. And that's because the writing is not a chore to me. The writing is an absolute joy. <laughs> so, you know, as, a, as I'm writing something and, and improving it and perfecting it, I absolutely love that. It's not, it's not time wasting for me. It's not, it's not kind of, you know, hard work. It's just something that I absolutely love doing. So, yes, once I've 
once I've uh, trialled it a couple of times, I can get it on YouTube, it's there for posterity, and then move on to my next project and yeah. start writing again. I'm a gamble like that a lot of the time with projects and myself, so yeah, get it completely with that. I want to ask you also, well, you remind me about Dave Lockley as well, the bootleg Mark Chapman. Yes, there's a name I've not heard now, for a while. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think I saw you in the last gig you did for, for Cuckoo. Yeah. And I'd seen you once before that when you two were going. Now, do you want to tell Amanda and everybody else <laughs> what the bootleg Mark Chapman was? And, and did, man, did you know who Mark Chapman is? But Mark Chapman's the man who shot John Lennon. So <laughs> there's a we actually nicked it off a group called Half Band Half Biscuit, who I'm sure a lot of your friends have. Yeah, like I know them. I've got friends that are massive with um, them. But there is a group called Bootleg Beatles who are meant to be the best Beatles tribute act and actually play really big venues there. And um, funnily enough, my mate Dave is a big Beatles fan and has seen Bootleg Mark Chapman and seen the Bootleg Beatles a few times. And there's a song called When the Evening Sun Goes Down on one of Half Band Half Biscuit's albums. Uh, where he actually, I don't know if you know Half Man, Half Biscuit, but there's lots of sort of really weird references to obscure they're weird, people. They're weird, aren't they? Aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a line that says, I'm off to see the bootleg Beatles as the bootleg Mark Chapman, meaning he's going to try and shoot the John Lennon. <laughs> and I absolutely love that line. So um, Dave is actually a very, uh, he's actually a serious singer-songwriter and has been performing for many years in bands and whatever. That's um, what got me when I saw you two there together. So I thought, I know how serious well, Dave is. Yeah. <laughs> I started, because I'm a poet, I started writing lyrics and he would get up on stage and sing some of his own songs and some of the ones that we collaborated on. And then I just wrote a really quirky song, which I completely forgot the name of it. But, um, it had a one-word title. It'll come back to me in a minute. And then I gave the lyrics to Dave, and he said, I really like that one. And then he said, why don't we sing it together? You know, you, I'll come to one of your comedy gigs, and I'll play guitar. And, and you traumatised, that was it, it was called, yeah, traumatised. Yeah, and um, we did that one, and it went really well. And we found <clears> a couple <throat> of uh, cover versions. Um, Corky and the Juice Pigs do a great song called The Only Gay Eskimo and Dolphin Boy. We, we nicked a couple of other songs. Then we started to write more together, so... As well as writing serious songs together, we started writing comedy songs that we enjoyed doing a few comedy gigs. And again, it was something different. You don't get many comedy duos doing comedy songs. So uh, we started to get lots of gigs. We actually got uh, to the final of the City Life um, competition, which is one that's been won by Peter Kay and Carolina Heard. We came about uh, last last plus one in the, in the actual <laughs> final, but it was quite an honour. We played to the comedy store in front of 450 people. So that was the kind of pinnacle. And we're still really good mates. We just got out of the habit of doing it and I moved on to you know, more solo stuff and bad company and Dave still, we're still really good mates and we, we could still, you know, pull off a boot like Mark Chapman's gig if we ever decided to. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Now, obviously, since you mentioned bad company, I better come into bad company next before we touch on your, Dave, your current collection. So I know the story about bad company, but for yeah. people that don't, do you want to tell them? Yeah, I was quite honoured to be recruited, really, because um, I'd met um, Gordon Zola quite a while ago. I'd not seen him for a while, but we'd started to uh, mix on the same circuit again for a couple of years. Jeff Armour, I only met, uh, he was running a gig at Tilsley, he was running one in Gulliver's in Manchester, and I just, uh, Gordon Zola told me it was a nice gig to do, so I just went along and did one and then met Jeff. And then um, after I'd known them both for a couple of years, so I'd been working regularly with them both for a couple of years, there was another poet who uh, sort of originally from Wakefield but lives in Wigan called Ian Whiteley, and Ian thought it would be a good idea uh, to put a, a bit of a sort of group together, so um, a group of poets who were doing songs to backing music and were doing some uh, political stuff and he was talking to Jeff, there was three of them, and they wanted to go for a quartet. And he got talking to Jeff and Gordon and said, I'd like to get a bit of a comedy element in this. Do you know anybody who does poetry who's on the same page as us in terms of socialism, <laughs> uh, but could also bring a bit of a comedy element? So God bless them, both Jeff and uh, Alan Gordon Zola thought that I might be the right man. And, God, um, God help him. <laughs> yeah, God help him. And he just took it, you know, I didn't have to rehearse or audition or anything. He had just took them at the word and we, uh, we started meeting and writing stuff and rehearsing and... Uh, the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> done, they've done two albums together as a quartet, haven't yeah, they, as we well? Made, so. yeah, we made two albums, yeah. The first one was a bit of a sort of mismatch. <clears throat> there was some good stuff on it, uh, which is called All Systems Go. And we I, always re I always remember that Theresa May one on that. Cause... It's, it's funny, because we think that's the worst recording in the sense that we all sound really flat. And, <laughs> you know, musically, yeah. it's a bit of a disaster. But whenever somebody buys it, they always come back and say, I really love the Theresa May. It was basically a parody of yesterday. I played it to you, Andrew. You've got to hear that May, one. Cause you told the immigrants to go away. So that was, <laughs> when she was Home Secretary, and then, of course, yeah. when she became Prime Minister, we just tweaked it slightly, but it was still relevant. Um, but we worked with uh, there's a fantastic Wigan folk band called uh, Merry Hell, uh, which are all the, the Kettle family, of all things. And John Kettle runs um, a recording studio in, uh, in Wigan where he sort of trains people to DJ and, and things like that. But he also um, helps people to do professional recordings. So we just had to turn up with a bunch of poems, give him a rough idea whether it was a, an upbeat punk thing or a more melodic thing. And he, he would put a tune together in about 10 minutes. And then he'd start working all his wonders on electronic drum beats and, <laughs> and all sorts of stuff. And usually took about a day to do one track. So um, wow, by the end awesome. of... Um, 
half a dozen or a dozen sessions, we ended up with a full CD. And the second one, which is called Raising the Standards, uh, we're, we're really proud of it. We think it's a really superb piece of work. We're no, just it, about to it, tour. I think, yeah, I think it's a good album. Yeah. Definitely. And yeah. I, I do like the.